Hello there, welcome to this week's Convex Conversation with me, journalist Helen Fospero. It's been a turbulent year for the royal family with the death of the Duke of Edinburgh, Harry and Meghan's controversial interview with Oprah and a rift between Princes William and Harry. And the headlines continue as Prince Harry says he realised in his 20s he didn't want the royal job or to be part of the operation as he calls it. He's just told American actor Dax Shepard he's putting his mental health and his family first and wants to break the cycle of genetic pain for his own children. These latest revelations mean this week's guest continues to be flat out. Katie Nicholl is a journalist and royal commentator for magazines like Vanity Fair and Grazia. She writes for the Mail on Sunday and is a regular on programmes like Entertainment Tonight as well as on British TV channels. She's also the author of books about William and Kate, Harry and Meghan. Katie it's fantastic to have us with you today. I'm guessing your phone has probably been ringing off the hook for the last 24 hours, has it? It has been ringing off the hook. In fact, I'd literally got got to the point of taking my makeup off last night, put the kids to bed. Of course, it, it's always the night that the husband has to go away for work. And I had GMB call me. They were desperate to do a pre-record for their news item the next morning. And I just had to be honest. I was like, I'm doing bedtime. I've not got any makeup on. And she's like, please, we really want you. Could we do it at nine o'clock? So I put them down, put a whole new face of makeup on, got myself ready. And, you know, and the day had been pretty much like that nonstop and all through today as well. Because as you know, when Prince Harry speaks out, which we're kind of getting quite accustomed to these days, it's always newsworthy. And, you know, front pages have been all dedicated to his latest revelations in this podcast. And it just feels, just when you think, surely there's nothing left to say, surely we've exhausted this topic. Prince Harry comes out with yet another bombshell. So yes, it has been very, very busy to say the least. Some of what he said is fairly damning, isn't it? I mean, his comparison about life in the royal family as a cross between the Truman Show and a zoo, one would imagine is going to cause a lot of pain, particularly to people like the Queen and his father. Well, actually, I think that that reference to the Truman Show and, and life in a zoo is probably one of the things that actually, certainly Prince Charles, and I would imagine the Duke of Cambridge as well, can probably relate to because... They may be royals, but they are still real people with real emotions. And I certainly think there have been many times over the Prince of Wales's long career that he has resented the media intrusion and has felt a bit like a monkey in a cage. And, and you know, William will have felt that too. So I think they can probably have some empathy for that, possibly frustration that Harry feels the need to air that. But I think probably what's really hit hard, actually more than that, is this suggestion of genetic pain being handed down. I think that's going to be much more hurtful, this idea that I suppose Harry feels that the Prince of Wales perhaps didn't change enough in his own parenting towards him, i.e. Harry and maybe even William, and has sort of taken some of the traits of how he was parented and inflicted them on Harry. And Harry sort of talks about wanting to break this chain. And this cycle, I think, is what he says. And I, I think that is probably more hurtful to Charles, who I know has gone out of his way to be a caring, hands-on father who's had to fill the role of both parents after Diana's death, you know, who was absolutely determined that she shouldn't just be airbrushed from memory, put pictures of her around Highgrove, made sure that Diana was talked about. That suggestion, I think, that he sort of didn't help Harry process his grief. In fact, Perhaps he did the opposite. I think he's probably going to be more hurtful than anything else Harry said in that podcast. And how do you think William will react? We've heard a lot, haven't we, over the last few weeks about a rift between Princess Harry and William, how perhaps there were signs of a little bit of healing at the funeral, thanks to Kate. Where does it leave the brothers now, do you think? Well, I think it was very clear to me, and I'd actually been told that Charles wanted to have this time with the boys after the funeral so that they could have some face-to-face -face time together, which is the first time they'd had that opportunity. There was clearly a desire on all parts to break the ice and to, to start a conversation. That happened. But 
I think any suggestion that everything was resolved in that walk around Windsor was very wide of the mark. It was clearly and is clearly going to take many more conversations until things are better. The problem is that Harry seems intent on throwing more curveballs and what he said is destructive. It does have repercussions. It has an impact. It raises the whole issue of trust. I know that the Duke of Cambridge and the Prince of Wales are both concerned that any private conversations that they have need to remain private in order for things to progress. So I certainly think that this podcast is not in any way helpful in terms of repairing this rift, both between William and Harry, but also I think between Charles and Harry too. There are very clearly tensions father-son tensions there, um, which are relatively recent tensions. Because if you think back to the royal wedding, one of my abiding memories of that beautiful May day was not only Charles walking Meghan down the aisle and stepping in at the last minute to do that when her own father couldn't be there, but the way that he embraced Doria, Meghan's mother, and made her feel so much a part of the day. He was so incredibly generous to Meghan. And actually, after the wedding, he invited Meghan and Harry to come and spend some time with him and Camilla at the Castle of May in Scotland, where he goes and spends part of his summer holiday. And that was a really clear indication, certainly to me, that the relationship between Harry and Charles was closer than it had ever been. So in a matter of months, things turned and became really quite difficult between them. And I think it's quite clear from what Harry has said on Oprah and what he's alluded to in this podcast that he feels his dad didn't do enough. And that's not just enough financially because he complained in Oprah that Charles apparently turned off the financial tap, which I don't think is true, but that's what Harry said. But I think it's more this suggestion that his father hasn't been there to support him on his mental health journey and support Megan, when she went through a very difficult time in the British press while they were still living here. It's a shame, isn't it? Because for me, watching that beautiful wedding, I almost felt there was a breath of air blowing through centuries of tradition. I thought everybody looked very relaxed. I thought the gospel choir was beautiful. Everybody looked like they were embracing a bit of a, a new chapter. And as you say, Prince Charles did look very happy and relaxed walking his new daughter-in-law down the aisle. So I presume it's not something that's happened post the wedding. Do you think there were things that were happening before that that have caused them to move to America and feel the need to air these grievances to the world? Well, I think f from listening to the podcast, I think it's very clear that Harry has not been happy within the royal family for a long time. I mean, I remember Harry saying to me, you know, there are times that he wished he hadn't been a prince. I mean, he said to me once when we were at Kensington Palace having a sort of off-the-record drinks meeting, you know, what's it like to get on the tube? What's it like to just go and order a coffee at Costa? What's it like to be just normal? There was, I think, always that yearning for him to just be normal, to just be ordinary, which is, of course, the very thing that he couldn't be because he is extraordinary through his birthright. I truly believe, and I think you're right, Helen, I think, you know, that wedding was a breath of fresh air. Meghan was a breath of fresh air. When I went on those early engagements with them as a couple, you could see that this was a woman who was experienced, who was confident, who knew how to work the crowds. And I remember at the time feeling really positive. I was like, he's got the person now, the person that can handle the spotlight, that can work the crowds, that has this special magic about her. It's all going to be great. And I think the wedding was a turning point, the fact that they could have the wedding that they wanted. I mean, the Queen really stepped aside and let them plan that wedding and do everything from the gospel choir to guests that they wanted to invite. They really were given a free reign to do that. I think where things came unstuck were really in Harry's deep-rooted unhappiness within the royal family. And I think in their hurry to try and implement change, they wanted everything done yesterday. They didn't want to wait until it could be done in perhaps a more palace timely way. So I think there clearly were issues. Certainly the portrayal of them in the press was something that they both really struggled with. And clearly they feel that they didn't have enough support from the royal family. And I think that seems to be the real sticking point. I mean, one of the things Harry says in that podcast is that moving to America was never part of the master plan. I'm not so sure I believe that because I think it probably was always part of Meghan's master plan to move back to California. But I do think that that idea of Harry giving up everything, his family, 
his home, his military titles. That was a big step. And I don't think it was a step that he expected to take. How do you think the Queen will be handling this? I can't help but feel a little bit sorry. She's dedicated her whole life to serving the country. She's mid-90s. She's just lost the Duke of Edinburgh, of course, has been by her side for decades. It seems a shame to me that every day she's reading these kinds of headlines. And she did cut such a lonely figure at the funeral, didn't she? She did. She cut a very lonely figure and it was absolutely heartbreaking to see the Queen alone, so grief stricken, no one there to sit next to her, to hold her hand, to comfort her. It was a terrible thing to see. And I think that most people would agree that for a 95 year old who has given up so much for her country, who has done so much for us as a nation and so much for her family, this just feels wrong. It just feels like a constant slap in the face. And I know that Harry was very keen to make it clear when he and Meghan alleged that there had been racist remarks made by a senior member of the royal family over the colour of Archie's skin, that it wasn't either the Duke or the Queen. He was obviously keen to protect his grandparents. The problem is that all of these attacks on the family, however they are skewered, all end up pointing to the Queen because she is the head of the family. She is the head of the institution. She is also the one who has bent and given and accommodated Harry. Along the years, she has been so supportive of him. I mean, if you think back to when he was launching the Invictus Games and she took part in that wonderful spoof with the Obamas, with the iPhone... You think, goodness me, the things that she did for him, she's allowed him to do everything he wanted from fighting on the front line in Afghanistan twice when it was a major security risk. She allowed him to do that. She encouraged him to do the Invictus Games. She gave her full blessing for him to marry Meghan, a divorcee, a woman who had a very colourful and illustrious career, who had clear visions of where she wanted to go. The Queen saw all the positives in that. So how does she feel? Well, it's very hard to know how the Queen feels because very few people really know how she feels. But I think it's fair to say that hurt and disappointment probably rank quite high up. And I remember speaking to senior courtiers around the time of Megxit. So that was January 2020. And the language that was coming out of the palace was exactly that. Hurt, disappointed, and I think a sense of disbelief. I do remember speaking to one of the Queen's oldest friends who said that she has been incredibly hurt. And who in the family is the biggest source of comfort to the Queen at times like this? Who does she lean on, do you think, Katie? Well, I think the Queen is very lucky in that she is well supported. Um, she, She has a very close relationship with her eldest son, the Prince of Wales, who is, of course, shouldering so much of those royal duties and responsibilities now more than ever. She is incredibly close to Sophie Wessex and her grandchildren, Lady Louise and Viscount James, who who live not far in Bagshot Park. Prince Andrew, I mean, yes, he's disappeared from public life. He's still very much a present person in the Queen's private life. They ride together, walk together. He's at Royal Lodge in Windsor, so very close. So she has got a good infrastructure of support. I mean, Ginny Early and Susan Hussey, her ladies-in-waiting, who have been with her for decades, know her very well. Two new little puppies have also been a real source of joy to her at a very, very difficult time. But as you say, she's grieving her husband of over 70 years. And life probably feels quite lonely at the moment. And I think at a time when she needs the love and support of her family, she is probably wondering what on earth Harry is doing. Where do you think it's going now? What next on that front? We know they've got very lucrative deals in the bag with Netflix and Spotify. A few days time, we're going to see the fruits of his labour with Oprah Winfrey and that mental health series, which he's co-produced with Oprah. I mean, I'm sure we will hear more of his repressed grief and his own experience of therapy and counselling and coming to terms with his mother's death in that series. And You know, I think it's going to be very interesting to watch the next steps for the Sussexes. Clearly, they have set their mission to become global philanthropists. Their foundation, Archwell, is all about compassion, community. We're certainly seeing them do things quite differently. And I think we're going to see them do some quite bold things, hopefully, 
they will go on to do great work and make a success of it. I genuinely hope they do because I think there is a case to be made in all of this that however badly it's been handled, and I think it has been handled terribly by Harry and Meghan, I I can't make excuses for that. The idea of someone who is sixth in line to the throne um, and therefore really quite removed from the seat of power, deciding to extricate themselves from the royal family and forge a new career path I actually don't think is such a bad idea. In an age where the monarchy has to slim down, it has to justify itself now more than ever. I don't actually have such a problem with Prince Harry leaving and going to America and starting a new life with his wife, particularly if that is a life of giving back to others and a life of philanthropic work. I think where people do have a problem with it is if they are seen to be cashing in on their royal connections, preaching to us all about climate change or therapy or whatever it may be, and then not putting those views and outspoken principles and ideologies to practice themselves. And that's possibly where it might all come unstuck. So we're in a period of watching history being made, watching it be reinvented, and really waiting to see how it goes. It could well be a success, but I think Harry and Meghan have to be very careful. How does it work with you, Katie? I mean, you've been a well-respected royal commentator for a very long time now. You and I have done many, many interviews on live television together. Can you give us sort of a sense of how it works, whether it's friendships that you develop with people who are close to the royal family? How do you get the insight that's away from just telling us the story that we're reading on PA? I mean, you always have a wonderful insight. You know what people are thinking and you have fantastic information, which is why you're so successful at what you do. But how do you do it? And how do you balance having the informal briefing with Harry and having that lovely conversation about the tube and the coffee? And then, of course, you're on air talking about him. How does it all fit together? It's a very, very fine balance. I think quite a difficult line sometimes. You can often find yourself in favour one minute and out of favour the next. So I will always remember being with Prince Harry and him him saying to me, this was when I was working at the Mail on Sunday, he was still with Chelsea Davey. The stories that made the paper were the stories about him and Chelsea, often falling out of nightclubs or falling out with each other or, you know, whatever explosive row they'd had. Those would be the stories. And he said to me, you know, why do you always have to write about us? Why do you always have to write about the girlfriends and the private lives? Can't you write something about, at this time, he was really pushing the charity Walking with the Wounded. And he said, look, there's this amazing girl and she is an amputee and she's going to be walking across Britain and I'd love you to speak with her, you know, and I'd love you to do a big piece. I'd just like you to show your readers a different side to me and the work that I'm trying to do and the spotlight I'm trying to put on these wounded servicemen and women. So I thought, okay, all right, I'll go and meet this person and I'll go and do part of this Walk of Britain, which I did. And it was fantastic. And we got a brilliant story out of it. Ended up being a a wonderful double page spread. And, you know, it was communicated to me through one of Harry's aides that he was really pleased with that. And he thought it was a great piece and he hoped to see more of it. And, you know, I did make a point and I still continue to make a point that where they're doing good, which is much of the time that we will put the spotlight on that. I mean, yesterday in Vanity Fair, I wrote about William and Kate's trip to Wolverhampton. It wasn't the most exciting trip ever. There were some nice pictures. It's important to put the spotlight on what they're doing during Mental Health Awareness Week. And that doesn't negate the appetite for other stories about the royals that are more personal stories, which, of course, are the stories that they don't want in the paper or published on the website more often than not. So it's a fine balance. And I think I always make sure that I've got really credible sources, that I always have two sources on information so I can be doubly sure that what I'm being told is right. I will always go to the palace and run something by them before I run it to try and get guidance from them. You know, if they strike it out, they say it's absolutely not true, then, you know, gone are the days of just publishing and being damned. We don't do that. I will take that guidance, want to get the story right, want to make the story accurate. And so it ends up really being a case of working with each other and having a good relationship with the palace. But 
I think increasingly in this age of social media and where we're really seeing the royals almost cutting out the need for royal correspondents like myself, they are now going direct to the consumer, whether that's through their YouTube channels or through Twitter or Instagram. They are communicating those pictures. They're communicating the stories. It is a case of less access. Absolutely. And so I think that's when contacts are more important than ever. And it goes back to your point in terms of that colour, that background, that insight, that really comes from the people who know the royals and know them in a private capacity and have often known them for a very long time. So I have done this for what, since 2006, when I ended up at a party with Prince Harry, which is how I got into the royal beat. Those people that I've met around both princes at that time, from polo matches to charity events, it's a case of just networking, I think, and having great people that will talk to you, that will confide in you and that trust you. It's so much of it does come down to to trust. I'd like to explore a bit more about Kate and William in a minute, but it would be fascinating to hear that story because that is on my notebook about how you got into it in the first place. I've known you for a long time and we've never had that conversation. So what happened in that nightclub with Prince Harry? These were my sort of heady days as a show business reporter. I was working for the Mail on Sunday and I'd come over from the Telegraph where I'd done their graduate training scheme and I'd sort of cut my teeth at at the Mail on Sunday, which was wonderful. And, you know, I was very, very young at the time and relatively glamorous back then. And, you know, still glamorous now. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. But love doing the showbiz circuit and found myself getting into all sorts of parties and engagements. I mean, I was the one that ended up crashing Kate Moss's 30th birthday party, which was that infamous orgy that I'm sure you all remember reading about (laughs) at Claridge's. And, you know, I got into wonderful, wonderful parties and covered the Oscars and went to the Cannes Film Festival. And it was all wonderful and all very, very exciting. And this was all pre-children and pre-marriage. And it was a brilliant and very opulent decade in my career. But during that period of time, I was at the Kensington Roof Gardens covering a party, which was actually pretty boring. And I'd gone out to get some fresh air. And at this point, they had these wonderful flamingos that were up on the terrace. And outside having a cigarette, admiring these flamingos was Prince Harry. Must have been about 18 at the time, just coming up to 18. And he was just about to take his A-level. So he should have been at home revising um, or at (laughs) Eton revising and having his head down in his studies. And of course, he was out partying with a load of gorgeous blondes, smoking Marlboro Lights and knocking back vodka. So when he sort of collared me on the doorstep and said, look, would you like to come to my party if yours is so dull? I said, well, yes, that'd be wonderful. So I ended up spending an evening with Prince Harry and all of his friends at a private room at the roof gardens. And I've never written about that night in any detail. I sort of realised then that I'd been given this opportunity to see in, made a few friends, got to know a few people. And this was before I had a column of my own in the mail on Sunday. So actually my face wasn't well known. I wasn't well known. So I was able to be relatively not, you know, conspicuous in that respect. But it really was a fascinating insight into the young prince and his life and actually made me really like Harry. I just thought it was brilliant that he was this royal rebel. And we ended up at many nightclubs and many polo matches over the years, often with him absolutely by that point, knowing who I was and glaring at me, wondering why on earth I'd made it behind the red rope that everyone else had kept behind. That's how it all started. And I suppose I was at that age in life where I could go to nightclubs. I remember hanging out at Bougie, The Cartier polo would always lead to some sort of after hours exploits. And it was just a wonderful ground for stories. And at that stage, I had brilliant access. And there were people in their circles who were pretty garrulous and prepared to talk and found the idea of talking to a reporter and then seeing the story end up in the paper all terribly exciting, I suppose. But of course, things have changed a lot. And, you know, the boys have grown up and had families of their own and they do very different things these days. So access has changed. And the story, of course, has changed. I think in many ways, covering the Royal Beat when I did was the most exciting time. Things really have changed. And I think it's all becoming a lot more sanitised and palace PR'd now. And there is a lot less access. And that's largely down to how the royals have had to change the way they're working during the COVID pandemic. But I do think there was always this steer towards them controlling their social media, them controlling their public image, and being able to do that far more through their independent platforms. 
And we see very good examples of that with Kate and William. They've just celebrated their 10th wedding anniversary, releasing that very personal and lovely footage of them actually on the beach with the children. Great portraits by a friend of mine, Chris Floyd. The talk of the YouTube channel now. Where are we with them? I mean, we're seeing a very different way of working with the monarchy now, aren't we, with them at the helm of that or them leading the charge on that, if you like. You know, I think the future of the monarchy is inevitably in William and Kate. And I think we are seeing very modern royals in William and Kate. I also think they are going to great lengths to make themselves more accessible to the public. I mean, the YouTube thing's really interesting, isn't it? Because they could have just continued putting videos out under the royal family's YouTube channel, but they wanted to have their own channel in the way that they wanted to have their own royal foundation. And that's totally understandable. They are carving their own identities within the royal family. But I think crucially what they're doing through their YouTube channel is reaching out to a younger audience, that sort of Generation Z, who will, of course, grow up watching William and Kate, knowing that that is going to be their future king and queen one day. So they are connecting a bond with that audience. And those are not necessarily the people who would go out and stand behind a barrier when William and Kate go and visit the West Midlands. They're reaching out to a much broader, more diverse, and I think ostensibly younger audience. And in that respect, they're being very clever about safeguarding, we hope, and I suppose the idea is that they are safeguarding their popularity with the next generation. So it's all been very carefully coordinated and planned. But I think if you just look back at the past year, 18 months. We have seen a change. I've certainly noticed a huge change in the Duchess of Cambridge. I mean, before the pandemic struck in the March when we went down into lockdown, I'd spent much of January and February traveling around the country with the Duchess, going on engagements as she launched this campaign into the early years. And, you know, this really is going to become the sort of cornerstone of the Duchess's work. This is her legacy, improving the lives of young people from before the age they start going to school in the hope that they're going to go on and live healthier, happier adult lives. So she is investing in that preschool generation. And this will be her legacy as she becomes the next Princess of Wales and a future Queen. And I remember just seeing this absolute clarity about her. Those years of research, those years of sort of choosing her causes carefully had really paid off because this is an area where she knows her stuff. She knows what she wants to do. She knows where she can make a difference. And now she's really doing it. And I would think, you know, as I was watching her with these children, this is where she comes to life. In the same way that Diana was always happiest working with children, Kate's exactly the same. She sort of lights up when she's with little people, little children. And I think that's when she does her best work. So it was a bit of a shame, really, when the pandemic sort of put a stop to all of that work, because I felt that we were just being introduced to this new role for the Duchess of Cambridge. And then as everything had to change tack when we went into lockdown, but it's certainly an area of her work that she's going to pick up again. And I think we're going to see her do a lot more in. And what's your relationship with Kate and William? I mean, when you're on the road with the Duchess, how do you get on and do you have a warm professional relationship? Yes, it is a warm professional relationship with the, with the Duchess, particularly. She's incredibly personable. She surprises me because she'll sort of come up and ask me about my daughter and will have remembered my daughter's name. And, you know, I remember both of us being in India and Bhutan and both of us saying how difficult it was being away from the children. And I wouldn't say too much. Well, I wouldn't really say anything about those conversations because they are off the record conversations and they must remain that way in order for that trust to be preserved. But I think it's fair to say that it would be like chatting to you. She is just friendly. She is warm. She's interested. She's engaged. She's an incredibly likable person. And William is the same. He's very funny. He's got a very dry sense of humour. It's lovely when you get to see that. And I think what's been so nice about this past year is that because of the way they're working differently, because of the Zoom call, allowing us to see more of the children, allowing us to see them working from home, things that we probably would never have gotten to see. We are getting to see more of the William and Kate that I've seen behind closed palace doors on the occasions we've been allowed to. It's lovely, I think, that the rest of the world is now getting to see a little bit more of their personalities and they are fun and they're friendly and very, very likable. And that's going to stand them in good stead because you can connect to them. And you see that with William and Kate when they're on engagements. A lot of people, when they meet royals, are very nervous to meet the royals. Understandably, they get in a flap, they can't remember how to address them. And one of William's ways of putting those people at ease is he sort of whispers to them, just 
just imagine me naked. And of course, they <laughs> burst into fits of giggles and they think it's hilarious. And in that moment, he's diffused any anxiety and nerves and they're all guffawing together again that reminds me of diana because she had that wonderful way with people and william has that too so i think they're going to be incredibly successful as the next prince and princess of wales they are absolutely dedicated to their charities to their causes they're dedicated to the queen and to her work and now supporting her for the rest of her life. So I think the Queen can feel very optimistic about the future because she's got William and Kate there. Didn't you get caught up in an earthquake in India with William and Kate? Yes, we did. We were travelling through India at the time. We'd done Bhutan, which was wonderful. I mean, that's another perk of the job. I mean, getting to go to these incredible places, somewhere like the Kingdom of Bhutan, which should be on everyone's bucket list because it's the most beautiful country with the kindest, most lovely people. You know, you get to do that. It's incredibly hard work. It's very, very gruelling. The hours are horrible. Um, I know William and Kate sort of had this habit of making it look a bit like a honeymoon, but it's tough, really, really tough. You talk to any palace courtier, they'll say that a royal tour is not a walk in the park. And you have to be prepared for the unexpected. Every type of travel, you know, from rickety old buses to military style aircraft. I mean, you never know quite what's going to happen next. And the earthquake was a classic example of that. And I remember we'd just done a sort of five or six hour journey across the countryside coming into Guwahati. And just as we were checking into the hotel, the building started to shake and the chandeliers above the reception were shaking, the glass was shaking. There had been quite a major earthquake in India a couple of weeks before that and that had caused a lot of devastation and damage. And all of a sudden, everyone in the hotel starts screaming and running out the hotel. So I sort of grabbed my colleagues. I was like, we've got to get out. My instinct told me that if it was going to get worse than a tremor, which fortunately it didn't, although that minute or so did feel like a lifetime, I just knew the best place to be was outdoors. It was absolutely terrifying. I mean, anyone that's been in an earthquake, I'm sure would say it's it, even a tremor of that sort of magnitude does, does feel quite frightening to feel the earth shaking from under your feet and sort of traveling up through your body is a very strange experience and a very frightening experience. And we talked about it with William when we met him for a drink a night or so later, because we often travel ahead of the royal party. So they were behind in the countryside that we'd just been visiting, where we'd done some conservation project. We'd moved ahead to the town to be ready for their arrival. And they'd got caught up in the earthquake in the countryside, which was in fact far worse where they felt it than when we had. I mean, I think William was sort of brushing his teeth at the time, getting ready for an early night, which is exactly what you should be doing on Royal Tour. When it happened, he said it was incredibly frightening. Kate was frightened and, and so were the staff. So you have to be ready for everything and you have to be pretty practical and very sensible when it comes to packing your clothes as well. You can't travel with a lot of clothes. You've got to learn to travel light. Have you mastered the art of capsule packing? Yes. Yes, I have. And I'm very proud that I have. I mean, it's wonderful because you sort of see the Duchess's team coming off the plane with trunks full of designer clothes and shoes and coat bags and everything else. And, and every sensible journalist will literally just have one bag. I remember one journalist who's passed now, but Judy Wade, who was Hello's Royal Correspondent, her bag meant missing once in Africa. And of course, you lose everything. You don't even have a clean pair of pants. So we all sort of had to chip in and give her a temporary wardrobe while her suitcase found its way to her. But I think, yes, traveling light is really important. I mean, I've been in all sorts of climates. So, you know, you will often find, particularly when you're traveling around somewhere like Canada, when you might be up in the Northwest Territories, in the tunnel landscape, which is probably another one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen, where it never gets dark and it's always cold. So you'll need everything from a sort of puffer that you can pack down in your suitcase because the next day or two days time, you'll be further south in a really hot climate. And it's just a case of, I think, packing for every eventuality, always taking a black dress wherever I go, because you never know if you're going to have to cover a death from wherever you might be in the world and your notes that would go with covering those events. A swimsuit I always take because it acts as a thermal layer, which is really, really handy. And you never know when you might get to go for a dip in the pool, which is always nice if it gets to happen. And an umbrella. I never travel anywhere without my umbrella. I remember when we were at the Taj Mahal with William and Kate and it was boiling hot. I mean, sort of in the 40s, absolutely sweltering. I just 
was so thankful for my little umbrella, which served as a parasol and just kept us, well, me and a couple of others just kept us sheltered from this burning sun because it, you're out there for hours. I know you see that sort of snapshot of the picture and, and that wonderful picture of them at the Taj Mahal where they reprised that image of Diana and sat on that bench. But to get that picture, I mean, I think we must have been waiting outside for nearly three hours, waiting for the couple. Everything had to be perfect for their arrival. And if you look at that picture, you'll see there's no one in the background. So you imagine trying to clear the Taj Mahal, which is what the officials had to do ahead of the royal visit. I mean, the detail and the planning that goes into these trips is quite extraordinary, but they're important and the pictures matter. And these are the pictures that go down in the history books. And of course, we are the spectators in it all. And I think you and I have both been lucky in our careers to be the spectators. You mentioned the Oscars. The Oscars is very similar. You broadcast from the Oscars, as you know, and you're wearing your borrowed half million pound necklace and you're in your beautiful gown. But you've probably been there 12 hours keeping your space and it gets cold in the early hours as all the celebrities come past. But you do always, when you're on television, Katie, you always look glamorous and composed. And I mean, sometimes you've been on a 15 hour road trip somewhere like Africa, haven't you? I mean, how do you manage with the clothes? Do you roll them and pick things that on purpose will pack really small. Yeah, I, I do. I, I try to avoid anything that needs ironing. I roll as much as I can. And I mean, I will spend days before a royal tour packing for it. So I will make a pair of crop trousers, go through a couple of outfits by teaming it with something different. Flats are always absolutely essential. They will always take one pair of heels, layers. And of course, really, as you know, from doing so much television on location, really, it tends to be from the waist up. So often I'll look very, very smart on the top and I'll be sort of like, as if I've been dressing for Zoom, I've probably got my Ugg boots on to keep me warm because it's, you know, it's it's a first thing in the morning or it's freezing cold where I am. As long as your feet are warm, I think you're always fine. And then if I know I'm going to be standing out at Windsor for hours on end, like I did with the birth of Archie, well, I've done all the royal babies, but I remember most recently the birth of Archie and it was cold actually when he was born. I will take a hot water bottle with me. So I just got a little hot water bottle and I'll slip it under my coat. The last thing you want to feel is cold. And often, you know, you're running on adrenaline anyway. You don't want your teeth chattering. You don't want your lips going blue. You just want, you know, you want to look great. You want to, you want to feel comfortable and you want to be warm. So I always find a hot water bottle is very helpful. But I think in terms of style, it's practical. And obviously you want things that look nice too. So I tend to go to M&S for dresses because I find they always fit well and they're amazing to roll. You know, you'll roll a dress up, pull it out and, it, and you don't need to do anything with it. And that's exactly the sort of thing that I need. And often I have to do all of my own television makeup. I've done that pretty much throughout the whole of the lockdown. I've always loved makeup. I've always loved making myself up. And I've always watched very closely when the makeup artists transform me from sort of pretty average to able to go on screen and look relatively decent. So I've always sort of watched them and picked up tricks of the trade as I've gone along. But I'm thrilled to have discovered Trini's new range of makeup, which is fantastic because all of her makeup comes in these stackable pots. So you can get a whole face done in a pot, five or six different pots. So that's when your capsule pack and and spaces at a premium. It's just brilliant. So yeah, I was thrilled to have discovered Trini makeup. And as I say, my trusty umbrella to make sure that I stay dry and I haven't got mascara slipping down my face. You are very high profile and, you know, we do all know your face now. Do you, do you get trolled at all, Katie? Because people do have very polarised opinions, don't they, when it comes to the royal family? Oh my goodness, they, they really do. And I think particularly when it comes to the Sussexes, Less, I have to say, far less trolled on Instagram than I am on Twitter. Instagram's a lovely, happy place to be. Um, <laughs> everyone's ever so, uh, so nice. There are some lovely people out there and I've got some really nice followers who will often keep in touch and I think watch everything I do on television, which I don't. They're like, oh, did you know you're on? Nope, didn't know I was on. Oh, you're very good. Or you've said this. Or I liked what you're wearing. And they will interact and engage. Whereas I do find on Twitter, there is a lot more spite, there is more malice. And I do find a lot of the Megan fans really quite unpleasant, I have to say. There doesn't seem to be any measure or any composure. They just seem to be a very angry mob that want to jump on you, even when you're not criticising. And I will get people sort of tweeting on a Vanity Fair article that I've written saying, well, you and the poison that you're writing about Megan. And I'm reading the article thinking there is nothing poisonous about this article. It's incredibly measured. It's very balanced, as I always try to be in my reporting. It's not my job to take sides and say who I like and who I don't 
like. It's my job to report and to bring colour and context through the sources that you and I were discussing earlier. So I try and ignore it for the most part. I try not to engage. Sometimes I can't help but respond because I actually feel it merits a response. And sometimes I just ignore it because I think actually that's all they want. They want a reaction. They want you to respond. And actually, I'd rather save my breath and my energy for something else. I don't blame you. Now, the Royal Beat is 24-7. Before we let you go, because I know you've got, as always, a very, very busy day in store. How do you find balance, Katie, in life with family, the children? Because it is 24-7, isn't it? You actually do never know when that phone is going to ring with another breaking royal story. Yeah, I mean, the phone is always on, which I wish didn't have to be the case. I would love to say, oh, on Saturdays, I turn the phone off and... I have uninterrupted family time with my little children where I never take a phone call, but I would be lying because I can't do that. And as you say, if something happens, a story breaks, I need to be ready for it. So I think now is not a very good example of this, but for the most part, it's relatively predictable. I know I will, for the most part, have a relatively quiet summer because it's when the Queen goes to Balmoral, the Royals take that extended period off. But you know, if I look at last year, that absolutely wasn't the case. So I think you have to be prepared for anything and everything, as you always are when you're on Royal Tour. You just need to have that mentality about everyday life. And I think just being prepared, I'm constantly reading, I'm constantly reading new books, I'm always on the phone to contacts. I'm always on the phone to other royal authors who always have fascinating insight. I just try and keep on top of the beat as much as possible so that when things happen, when things break, I'm able to react, respond and write quickly and under pressure. So I think it's just being prepared. But there is, of course, downtime. And, you know, when there is, I make the most of it. I love spending time with my family and being out in nature, going for walks. Exercise is really important to me. So I try every morning when I've done the school run just to squeeze in a quick jog. I live quite close to the countryside. So I try and put a a run in every morning just to have that moment to breathe, that moment to exercise, that moment to be in fresh air. And I then find I can come to my desk with a sense of clarity and I'm ready for the day. So I think it's just about pacing yourself and being prepared. Do you know, it's been fantastic. Thank you so much for squeezing us in today. When I looked at the headlines this morning, I, I half expected you to have to email and say that you were, you know, no, you had I to be else. No, I I'm don't not. cancel. I will probably be popping up in a few places later on today. But uh, <laughs> no, I didn't want to cancel. I really enjoy the podcast. And it's been lovely to speak and reflect on, gosh, a, a remarkable 15 years. When I think about all the things I have covered, it's quite amazing, really. It is hard work and it is stressful and it's hugely pressurised but I do feel very privileged to have witnessed what I've seen from the Diamond Jubilee to royal weddings, royal funeral, covering the Duke of Edinburgh's funeral was the first big royal funeral I've ever had to cover for the BBC, which was an extraordinary experience. I felt a real sense of responsibility. You know, I'm reporting on a great man and trying to reflect the mood of the nation. So, It is high profile, but it comes with a great sense of responsibility. And I take that very seriously indeed. You can tell you take that responsibility very seriously. And it's been a real privilege to hear just some of the stories. I know in 15 years, there'll be many, many stories we haven't had time for today. Perhaps we'll do a part two at some point. But thanks, Katie. And it's great to see you again. Lovely to catch up with you. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. You've been listening to journalist Katie Nicholl giving us a remarkable insight into her life as a royal commentator for the last 15 years. Download and subscribe to our podcast series at convex.podbean.com or search The Convex Conversation on Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts or just ask Alexa. Next week, I'll be chatting to photographer Chris Floyd, who's captured the great and the good, both on digital and film, and whose portraits of Kate and William were released to mark their 10th wedding anniversary. So I shall see you then. Bye for now. Thank you.